Well, good afternoon and welcome along to Unbelievable with me, Justin Briley. It's Saturday afternoon, time of the week here on Premier Christian Radio, when we get Christians and non-Christians together for discussion, dialogue and debate. And, uh, well, it's a big issue this last week, the thing we're, uh, we're talking about, uh, the anti-Islam film. I'm sure you can't fail to have heard about the various protests and riots that it's caused around the world. Well, I'm going to be introducing my guests, joining me to talk about that this week in just a moment's time. I'm Justin Briley with you through till four o'clock this afternoon. And of course, we're online at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. Don't forget, that's a good place to go if you want to find out about some of the other things associated with this show. It is a a show that uh, in the main exists to defend the Christian worldview. And we do a conference now each year called Unbelievable, the conference. Triple DVD available now if you'd like to see uh, some of the guests we had here in London in May and um, join with the hundreds of delegates who attended that, uh, an apologetics conference aimed at putting evangelism and Christian evidence together. Uh, Unbelievable, the conference 2012. As I say, available from the website, premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. Also, um, you can catch up with this interesting project that we've launched recently, the Atheist Prayer Experiment, a bit more on that later on in the show um, very interesting first week of that um, of that particular project but uh, let's leap into today's show for now as I'm joined by Christians and Muslims as usual to discuss and debate um, what is a hot potato at the moment it's the uh, recent film that's been causing protests all around the world you're unbelievable <laughs> It's called The Innocence of Muslims. It's an online film that purports to show that Islam is false, that Muhammad was a paedophile and, well, numerous other things. Well, in the last two weeks, it has caused protests and riots around the world and resulted in a number of deaths, including that of the US ambassador to Libya. Well, governments have condemned both the film and the reaction to it. The filmmakers have gone into hiding. Discussing the whole issue and some of the many questions it raises, uh, today with me in the studio, James White. He runs Alpha and Omega Ministries in the US. He's uh, no stranger to this show, uh, very kindly often joins me from the US to discuss and debate issues of theology or um, he's come in and discussed with Muslims before. Over in the UK at the moment, doing some debates with Muslim guests. Um, also joining us in here in the studio, Mohammed al Husseini, a fellow in Islamic studies at Leo Beck Rabbinical college those are my guests with me right now and i should say um somewhat interestingly we do have a third guest due to join us but has been delayed badly by traffic and the like so um we hope to be joined at some point in the program today by hamza tortoise who is a muslim apologist and a speaker for the islamic education (coughs) research academy but in the meantime um my two guests at least joining me for the moment are um muhammad al husseini as i mentioned and james white Uh, thank you gentlemen both for being with me today thank you Justin. it's great to be here great to have you both um james uh, as you've come the furthest to be here uh, all the way from phoenix arizona yes. thank you very much for for coming on and um you're really this is a, a kind of a break in a debating it sort is. of schedule that you've got lined up while you're here in the right. uk so um at the time that we're recording this you've just come from a debate last night um i think the, the subject was was muhammad prophesied in the bible right. How did that go? Well, you know, the amazing thing was, in the midst of all that's going on, this took place at mm. the East London Mosque, and there were uh, many hundreds, if not thousands, of, of Muslims coming in and out of this mosque. Mm. Uh, and, of course, it, it's a very interesting area I'd never been in uh, before there in, in East London. And yet we had um, total freedom to say what we needed to say, and um, I do use that term advisedly what mm-hmm. we needed yeah. uh, to say because look we're, we're looking at a debate the subject was the, the Quran teaches in Surah 61.6 and Surah 7.157 that the people of the book find um, uh, the unlettered prophet Muhammad in their own scriptures in mm-hmm. the Torah mm-hmm. in the Injil and that Jesus actually even prophesied uh, of a prophet named Ahmed and so that was the subject of the debate, and as a Christian scholar, I have to respond to that, and, and my summary statement was, uh, it's untrue. What the Quran says at this point is simply untrue. There is no reference to Muhammad in the Christian scriptures, or the, in the Torah and the Injil. And I could say that, and I did not feel any, um, I mean, I knew when I was saying it, uh, there, was, there was a little bit of a hush in, yes. in the room, yeah. but I did not feel any intimidation or anything like that. We were treated very graciously. We had excellent conversations afterwards. And it's interesting that that can happen here. But my fear, honestly, is the places where that can happen 
are diminishing, not expanding in our world today. Well, tell us just briefly, for those who are catching this in time, who are perhaps listening on the Saturday or, or, or the, to the podcast in the, the next couple of days, um, where you'll be, as it were, on Monday night. Monday night, we're going to be at Twin Home Baptist Church, and I'll be debating Adnan Rashid, who <coughs> Adnan and I have been on uh, on the program here uh, together uh, at least once uh, that I recall. And uh, we are going to be doing a doubleheader, uh, mm. it, which in, is a baseball term in the United States. Uh, I'm not sure if you have doubleheader <laughs> football no, we, matches. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah good. All right. Um, we're going to be doing two debates on that evening. Uh, the first will be on the transmission of the text of the New Testament, mm -hmm. and the second will be on the transmission of the text of the Quran. And the reality is, even last evening in our debate, that came up as an issue. I mean, obviously, the validity of, of your scriptures, whether they've been transmitted over time, I don't know how many programs you've done <laughs> uh, as a faithful listener to Unbelievable, um, uh, on that particular subject with Bart Ehrman and, and, yeah. and all, the, all the rest of that stuff. Um, so it, it's obviously a very important subject, and uh, so we'll be addressing that on Monday evening. Great. Well, um, if you want to find out more, I think details are at your website, yes. aomin.org, um, and equally at uh, the uh, the website of Doug um, McMaster's church, um, Trinity Road Chapel. Um, is that the right one? Yeah. Um, so so uh, I'll obviously post that up with the podcast as well for those who, who are downloading in time. Um, Mohammed, thank you for joining us you, again. Um, uh, you are also becoming some, something of a regular <laughs> uh, um, guest as well, and uh, it's great to have you back. Um, as I mentioned, you're a fellow in Islamic studies at Leo Beck Rabbinical College. But uh, what you've come in before to talk about is scriptural reasoning. Yep. That's a sort of dialogue initiative uh, between Christians, Jews and Muslims. Um, and uh, I suppose this whole stuff that's been going on this last two weeks really kind of comes slap bang in the, the area of, of what you're interested in trying to do, which is to make the conversation a a better one, yep. um, one that isn't going to make people sort of start to take it out on each other. Well, absolutely. Um, I think, um, you know, the uh, aim of scriptural reasoning uh, from the outset has been not to engage in uh, in that horrible interfaith activity of saying nice things we don't really mean to people mm. we don't really like, <laughs> which is my definition of interfaith. And I get into a lot of trouble for being very outspoken about that, uh, but rather to foster better quality disagreement. And I totally echo uh, what James has been talking about. There is a long and noble tradition uh, within all three of our traditions, actually, mm. of, of quite robust um, polemics, uh, deep discussions around theological issues. Uh, my, my thesis, in fact, was on um, medieval Islamic and Jewish uh, philosophical discourse on the doctrine of the Trinity. So uh, Arabic-speaking uh, Jews and Muslims have been working around in this uh, polemical area for, for, for many centuries. So, so that's, that's really, really important. Uh, but at the same time, um, I think uh, what we need to uh, say very, very clearly is that uh, what's going on in the world at the moment isn't really uh, theological uh, so much so much as tribal. Mm. And my position throughout uh, everything I've said is that the Muslim community is contaminated with a, uh, idolatry on, on a monumental scale. So worship of Muslim tribal identity is far more important to many Muslims uh, than worship of the one God. And uh, and uh, tribal vengeance, including desecrating the name of the one God by uh, by murder and mayhem, and and this slaughter of innocents mm. in Benghazi, mm. uh, is one example of that. Is is exactly where the Muslim community has gone very very wrong. It's it is very sad, um, and I, I'm sure we can all agree that we condemn any violence. I mean, what do we make of this video itself? Um, I don't know, <coughs> gentlemen, you've both had a chance to actually watch it. Um, James, what did you think? Well, the, all that was available uh, was were all the trailers. Mm. I think there was like 14 minutes of it or something like that. And, and uh, what you have is uh, the worst of the... Look, on, on both sides, we have people who desire to believe the worst about the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to fight this all the time from uh, from my perspective, and I guess there's people fighting that battle from the other perspective as well. Um, what you have are certain facts normally drawn from the Hadith, the, the collection of stories and sayings of the Prophet and his companions, which are, is a large volume of, of work. I, I, I mean... Um, I guess we need to describe it because this is the source. 
you have the two primary collections that are that are seen by Sunnis as being primarily authoritative, and that's Sahel Bukhari and Sahel Muslim. But then you also have others alongside those Sunan Abu Dawood and so on and so forth. But these are these are stories that uh, portend to go back to the time of Muhammad, and you can. The, the problem we face today is that you can pick and choose from this material what you want to pick and choose. And so what these filmmakers have done is they have taken certain stories from the Hadith, they've decontextualized them, and they've basically presented them in a way that would be the most possibly offensive to a Western audience. Mm. So in other words, there's no longer any recognition that the, the people we're talking about were living in Arabia mm. uh, in the 7th century. And so it's not judged on the basis mm. of that. It's all put into the modern context. And as a result, it... it what I've seen is is not only it looks like someone went ran down to Best Buy and bought a Sony cam and they're just standing there. You know, to do it this is thing. bizarre. Actually. Oh, it's bizarre. It, 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 it really is strange, uh, bizarre film. <laughs> but it it's, it it comes across as as being ex, an extreme example of of mockery. It certainly cannot be considered any type of serious apologetic argumentation. It it, it does strike one as as almost having been put together precisely to. Yeah. Yes, uh, insults and to to to, to yeah. antagonize uh, rather than start some kind of serious. Uh, but there are people on, on on unfortunately in every tradition that consider that to be their duty. Mm. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, there are Christians who think uh, there's there's a whole group of Christians in the United States that show up outside of of events with signs <coughs> and they um, yell and scream at people. Mm. I mean, I used to go up to the Mormon conference in Salt Lake City every six months and pass out tracts and witness to people, the whole group. We'd be dressed nicely. We would have conversations with people. If someone wanted to take a tract, great. If not, you know, but we were there. For, we did that for 18 years. You know why we don't do that anymore? These folks show up. They're staying there with their signs. They're yelling at people. And they, they, they literally would yell at people walking by, going into the general conference of the Mormon church. It shouldn't be Mormon. It should be moron. And they think that's preaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, they, and when they get hatred back, mm. they feel that they are being persecuted for righteousness' <laughs> sake. So, unfortunately, every tradition has folks like that. And what you've, what you've got here is when those two extremes run into each other, there's a violent, re- yeah. re- violent reaction. Uh, let's talk about the reaction. And, um, Muhammad, I suppose uh, the problem is that tensions do run high when it comes to the Islamic view of the Prophet Muhammad. Absolutely. And um, just maybe give us a, a sense of why this would be, for, for, for the average Muslim viewing this film, it would be deemed so offensive. Well, um, I mean, first of all, we just just to pick up on what, what James has, has rightly said, you know, we need to look at the motivation behind this film. And one of the things that immediately struck me about uh, this chap, Sam Basile, uh, was the way that he presented himself as an Israeli Jew. He's not. And he played directly into uh, is, uh, the, the endemic anti-Semitism, yeah. Yeah. Judeophobia that exists he, in the He in kind the of tried world. to load it with as much possible. So the purpose of this film was nothing to do with robust apologetics and, and disagreement around different uh, our, our, our truth-seeking, uh, but rather to, to cause offence. And as... And I, do need to say at the outset that uh, both uh, as Muslims and indeed as Christians, uh, we are called uh, neither to insult or offend, nor indeed to to be interfaith um, kind of people who say insincere things and and cover the truth, uh, but rather to be truth seekers like Cornelius, and and that involves uh, making very robust. Uh, investigations, very strong interrogations into the teachings of our respective faiths and to, and to ask very searching questions of them. Um, that, however, does not extend uh, to, uh, to as, as James says, to, to, to aiming uh, to close off that kind of conversation. Uh, and I'm very concerned uh, that the way that particular sort of sacred figures are targeted uh, in this current environment in the name of so-called free speech, which isn't really free speech, uh, leads to leads to um, uh, an enormous amount of, of antagonism. I mean, that, that whole issue, though, of free speech mm-hmm. is, is kind of at the centre of this yeah. because obviously there are certain people who are saying, well, this just shows how intolerant Islam is. Uh, whatever you make of the film, people should be free to produce stuff that insults, that... Um, you know, says this kind of thing. And uh, from that perspective, it, it, it raises this question. Mm-hmm. 
is there an issue of free speech at stake? I mean, you, you come from the U.S., James. I come from you the U.S., the, yeah. The First Amendment and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. where, where do you stand on this? Well, my, you know, I come from this as not only as an American but as a, as a Christian. Mm-hmm. I <clears throat> am very concerned because secular governments tend to view almost any disagreement as possibly inciting violence. They, they will not – secular governments will not make a distinction – between uh, Muhammad and I sitting here and being able to have a, a debate on a theological issue and those other folks who are going to end up coming to fisticuffs. We're not going to come to fisticuffs. We're going to go to our sources. We're going to you know, debate these things in a, in, in a different way. Secular governments just put it all under one, one rubric, one, uh, one cover. And I'm very concerned because, for example, uh, I do a lot on YouTube. I do a lot of videos, and I address a lot of Islamic subjects on YouTube. I'm very, very concerned uh, that those videos are just going to disappear one day and my entire account is going to disappear along with 530 some odd videos in the process. Um, All because of this um, concern about politically correct speech. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe that the way to respond to films like this, first of all, I had never heard of this film Mm. until this event. I mean, and, and I'm, I work in this area. So obviously it had had absolutely zero impact. No one had heard about it. And my concern is that something like this is going to result in meaningful dialogue being suppressed as well. And so I think the way you respond to films like this is you don't do it by shutting down uh, freedom of speech. You do it by responding to it in such a way that you – not only correct its misapprehensions. As a Muslim, I would view this as an opportunity. Mm. When I get into a debate and my opponent starts misrepresenting my perspective, that's actually handing me the opportunity of not only correcting them, but now doing teaching in the process and literally winning the debate. And so it would seem to me that the proper response, I mean, even the Quran says, argue not with the people of the book except in the most beautiful ways. Okay, well, how do you do that? Uh, Killing the ambassador to the United States in Benghazi is not how you do that. You do that by saying, okay, let's look at this clip. And the source of this allegedly would have been this hadith. But what they don't tell you is this and this and this. You contextualize it, and you 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 have the opportunity of actually giving a positive presentation in light of the error. I mean, what strikes me, though, is that the majority of people doing the protesting, the writing, have probably never seen the film. Um, Exactly. And so to some extent... Are there leaders within Islam who are using it as an excuse to whip totally. up fervor and that kind yep. of thing, Mohammed? Yep. Oh, totally. Um, I mean, Muslims don't read books. I know that. I can say that. Muslims don't read books. I feel Islam in R- my rather heart. Rather a general <laughs> statement, isn't it? <laughs> I feel Islam Mohammed. in my heart. I don't need to read the Quran. I can bang on about the Quran, but I usually find the Christian apologist knows more about the Quran and the Hadith than I do. That's kind of a very standard scenario. We get very bored of it. Um, but I think, I think what we have here is is a really complex issue around freedom of speech as as um i think where i'm coming from is we are as muslims and christians caused caused to be people of truth seeking and i don't believe speaking theologically that god has given us free speech what god has given us is free will and free will includes the right uh, in god's eyes to sin to blaspheme to uh, turn away from him, to reject truth. And we will be punished for it. We will be punished for it in the hereafter. Mm. And the question uh, in, in my mind is, is how dare you play God uh, by looking into the heart of another person and, and passing judgment in this world uh, upon uh, an individual for, for offensive things that he may or may not say? Yeah, I, I suppose, I, I mean, what I'd, I suppose I'd be interested in knowing is whether you think that... That man, whatever his real name is, mm-hmm. uh, it seems to be up in the air at the moment. Um, sh- it, did he have a right to do that? Did you know? Should, should he? However much we disagree with the, the content and the tone of the film, did he have a right to produce that film and to show it to people? Well, I think if we look at if we look at what international instruments say about free speech and the and the, and the law in different countries, uh, there's a remarkable consistency around this. There is the right to to criticise. Uh, to 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 in fact uh, defame religious beliefs, um, there is, however, not the right 
uh, to say things that incite to an environment where people are going to get threatened or hurt. And I think uh, the idea that free speech is kind of an absolute dogma mm. uh, that overrides every other dogma, including the right to leave, live in, in, a, in an environment that is free from harassment and, and persecution is, is quite important. So, for example, the free speech to say that Jews poison wells, mm. that the Holocaust never happened... Uh, the, the right to spread anti-Semitism, and in fact, in the UK, law the, light, the right to glorify terrorism. All these things are outlawed because they result in genuine concerns around people's ability to live uh, free from harassment. Uh, I took a very tough line with, for example, this, this, uh, this idiot Muslim painter who painted naked pictures of Hindu goddesses. You know, I was very angry about that. I'm not a person who's opposed to, to, to robust disagreement, but that action of itself did nothing, you know, as, as, as J- like James's an- anecdote, mm. did nothing to contribute to a to constructive uh, critique of Hindu beliefs or, mm. or, or ideas mm. uh, and did nothing uh, to, uh, to, to, to advance the cause of, of free dialogue and exchange in, this, in the pursuit of truth. What it did do was create an environment where people felt threatened, uh, where, where it resulted in genuine public order issues. And I think there, there, is, there is a line in the law uh, that, 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 uh, that, that can be drawn. Um, and it's, it's a complex line. It is. But it we, is. Should not, we should not hold up free speech as some kind of absolute yeah. secular dogma. And I don't think that's a Christian position any more than it's a Muslim position. Yeah, my concern here, however, is that um, who gets to gets to draw that line mm-hmm. and on, on what basis? Quite. And given that we are talking about secular governments now, my concern is that I'm already seeing that line being drawn in such a way as to limit the free speech of Christian people in Western governments today, mm-hmm. not just on the subject of, of Islam primarily, but, for example, uh, in the United States and in, in uh, uh, Europe as well, uh, the freedom to address issues of marriage, sexuality, and things Quite. like that is vanishing very, very quickly. Absolutely. And you, you talk in – you did a blog recently, I think, or, or your show recently, Creeping Dimitude in yes, the USA. Yes. I mean, is this uh, – potentially an example of, of that continuing to happen? Well, especially, and I, and I haven't been able to verify this, but my understanding is that federal authorities showed up at this guy's house uh, and, and actually took him into, a, into custody, like at midnight. Um, that's, that's, it, it, that really makes me, as an American, go, what happened to the Constitution again? I mean, there's mm-hmm. this thing called due process and stuff like that that seemingly has gone out the, gone out the window. I'm very, very concerned uh, I think we have to err on the side of freedom over against restriction for one simple reason. Governments only get bigger, they only get more powerful, and they only get more repressive. And every government has a worldview. Every government has a worldview. I don't, it, I don't care which government it is. You can be a secularist. Secularism is a worldview. And the secularist is not going to uh, honor the desire that we have to have open dialogue, they're, they're going to shut that down over time. And it's, it is a creeping process, and we have to fight it all the way along the line. So I'm not, I, don't, I don't view freedom of speech as a quote-unquote dogma, but I do believe that people have the right to make fools of themselves, and the way to deal with that is to demonstrate that they have made fools of themselves. And to be honest with you, if, if there hadn't been the kind of reaction to this thing, like I said, no one had heard about it. Mm-hmm. It would have had no impact. And to be honest with you, I don't see that it's going to ha- continue, have any impact at all on an argument level because it makes no argument. No. It's, there's, there's no possible way it can be defended. And that, is, for thinking people, and this is the issue that, that we just brought up, for thinking people, that is the greatest refutation. Will we make our laws pander to the lowest common denominator of people, the people that will riot in the streets? Or do we call people up to a higher level? That's really the question. Well, I think um, I think it's for us as us to think as Christians and Muslims instead of uh, as uh, citizens of secular states in this regard. And I think there's this is a complex issue, and there are, there are lessons to be learnt on both sides. On the one hand, I don't think uh, Western secular governments have have any moral high ground uh, to uh, to call the rest of the world sort of red in tooth and claw. Um, you know this. You know one of the things. You know quite rightly uh, that, that James mentioned is is the inability to to 
speak up uh, about moral issues. Uh, we had the recent case in Brighton of uh, of a couple that were uh, were threatened with legal action because they displayed anti-abortion images. Uh, this is a country that uh, commits infanticide on an industrial scale. In the United States, since 1973, there have been 50 million uh, children that have unborn children that have been uh, wiped off, wiped out. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is no moral high ground in the way that the West engages around these issues. Uh, likewise, you know, we talk about uh, the violence and the bloodletting and the, you know, the very uh, cheek by jowl uh, killing that goes on in Muslim countries in the third world and in African countries and elsewhere. Well, you know, you know, like like people who, uh, you know, like their meat sort of nicely wrapped up in waitrose and don't want to know where it comes from. We don't know, want to know where our oil comes from. We don't want to know uh, where our lifestyle comes from. It comes from cluster bombs dropped on uh, on on innocent people. I'm very concerned and as James is about the oppressive character of, of Western secular governments. I was involved, as you know, in the Occupy movement. Um, I'm one of the troublemakers from <laughs> the St. Paul's protesters. And, you know, various colleagues of mine got sort of taken away on trumped up charges because they'd said things or, or protested. So the right to protest is really important we, to me. We- we're going to have to take a quick break and uh, we'll be back in for part two. Hopefully uh, we may be joined by... Um Hamza Torsis as well, who uh, are due to be with us, but transport issues, I mean, he's uh, running rather late for today's programme, but um, hopefully he may be able to contribute at some point in our discussion. Talking today about this controversial film that has provoked so many uh, protests and unrest around the world, deaths, and um, The Innocence of Muslims is the name of it, uh, and it would be interested in hearing your thoughts on it as well, uh, especially on the issue of whether, you know, people have a right to be able to say these things, to insult other religions, um, where we draw that line. Uh, do get in touch. Unbelievable at premier.org.uk is the email address. And of course, you can reach me via the Twitter and Facebook accounts for this show at unbelievablejb on Twitter, facebook.com slash unbelievablejb as well if you want to interact on Facebook. So look forward to hearing from you and um, do download the show, pass it on to others, and uh, get all the links for my guests joining me today at the website premier.org.uk slash unbelievable be back in just a moment's time with more from my studio guests James and Mohammed you're listening to unbelievable on premier Christian radio James White nodding his head along he's a he's a regular listener and uh, so he he's uh, familiar with the jingles and the show tune uh, you're listening to Unbelievable, as that lady just said, and it is um, the show that brings Christians and non-Christians together. Uh, today, topically, uh, we are addressing this issue, and uh, apologies if you were tuning in today expecting to hear a discussion on egalitarian versus complementarian theology. We're, we're holding that off for a week, so um, I'll tell you about that a bit later on in the show. But because of recent events around the world, um, protests, riots, um, because of this uh, controversial film, uh, The Innocence of Muslims, that has provoked so much unrest. Uh, joining me today in the studio, James White and Mohammed al Uh James is a Christian, Mohammed a, a, a Muslim, and uh, they've both been agreeing in large part on, on aspects of, of how we should view this film, uh, the response that there's been to it. Um, and I, I know that we were talking about whether we should people should have the right to produce insulting derogatory types of um, things and and i mean the reason why this has sparked such a reaction as far as i can see is because of the way muslims revere the prophet muhammad perhaps in a way that is quite different to the way christians perhaps revere the person of jesus um uh, talk to that james what what do you make of this um well, it's interesting you, you say different than the way that Christians revere Jesus. I mean, obviously, uh, as a Christian, I believe that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, that he is deity, he's my maker, he created all things in heaven and earth. And so I, I worship him as my creator as well as my redeemer. Uh, you can't revere anyone more than that. The question becomes, though, when someone blasphemes someone that you love, and I love Jesus, it hurts me when... when in Western culture, we've, we all know about all the massive amount of blasphemy that's aimed toward Jesus in art and in culture today. Uh, the, but what did Jesus teach that my response was that to that was to be? And this is where I, I do see a fundamental difference, because Christianity began as a persecuted minority religion. 
And for the first 250 years of its existence, um, you could lose your life in the Roman Empire for being a member of that religio illicita, that illicit religion. And the worst persecution was at the end of that period, from about 250 to 313 A.D., And many Christians lost their lives. You could lose your livelihood. Even the possession of the Christian scriptures was illegal. A lot of us don't know what it was like during that time period. And that stamped a character on the faith that could never be wiped out. Uh, As Tertullian said, you know, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And when people saw how people were willing to give up everything uh, and, and not take up arms but to willingly suffer for this Messiah in the name of love, that, that, changed, that changed the Roman Empire and, and changed, how, changed everything. That's where the difference lies, because the, the Christianity begins in one way. Islam begins in a completely different way. And you have the first from 610 till 622, and, I'll, and, and, and Muhammad can certainly uh, correct me if I get anything wrong here, but you have a, a brief period of where, where Muhammad is a minority prophet in Mecca, and he is abused. There are stories uh, of people uh, throwing uh, uh, entrails upon him while he's praying, and, and his, his followers are abused and beaten. Brief period of time, very similar to a much longer period of time in, in Christian history, where, where those first followers of Muhammad are treated in a similar way to the Christians are. But then you have the Hijra, and then you have Medina, and now you have the Battle of Badr and Uhud, and you have uh, all the interactions with the Jewish tribes and, and all the rest of that stuff that comes. And finally you end up with things like Surah 9, you know, fight the, 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 the Al-Kitab and, and wherever they are. And, and you have a different context. And then as Islam spreads... It is, it is not a minority religion under the persecution of the majority ruling authority, but it is the ruling authority in those lands, resulting in the driving out of Christians and Jews from first from Mecca and Medina and then, and then the Arabian Peninsula and so on and so forth. And so you have a very different background there. And my concern is that the sources that Muslims go to, and this is something I'm sure Muhammad can, can address very clearly here, the sources that the people that are reacting in the strongest way, their leaders, not the people that are actually doing the reacting, as, as Muhammad said, uh, I, I, let, let, me, let, let me make a statement and see if you would agree with me, that I probably know more about the Hadith than the vast majority of, oh, yeah. the, of the Muslims in the Muslim world. Yeah. They've, they've, they've had it mediated to them by these leaders that frequently are more political than they are religious in their orientation. But the sources themselves, the, the Hadith itself, provides stories of uh, Muhammad had political enemies who would uh, use poetry as their means of expression. That was a very powerful thing in the, in the Arabic culture at that time, was if you wrote a poem mocking Muhammad, that, that could have massive impacts upon his followers and the political dynamics of Medina and everything else. He would have people go and kill those people. And they look at those and they say, see – If the prophet did it, that gives us the right to do it. And my concern has always been, I haven't had a chance to to express this to Muhammad, but my concern has always been when I listen to especially my very conservative Muslim friends, the sources, when I hear people standing up, even as conservative, believing Muslims, Sunni Muslims, Salafi Muslims who who believe that you have to follow everything in the Hadith. I mean, this is this is binding. Those first few generations give us the example that's supposed to define the Ummah forever. When I see those that are trying to stand against jihad and and against terrorism and things like that, I wish them all the the best in the world. But my concern is the battlefield of debate is a body of material that is not consistent enough with itself to actually come to a final conclusion. That is my biggest concern. Mm. Because as I study the Hadith, it all becomes a matter of, okay, my scholar says, I put him in this order, and I make this story normative over this. But then somebody else's scholar puts it in this order, and Mm. they don't think you should interpret this story in that way. That is my biggest concern. And one of the things that comes up as a result... Is the is for today, for example, is the Pakistani blasphemy law hmm. that is used to persecute yeah. Christians so much mm-hmm. in the modern period? Yeah. I mean, it, it could be said 
that um, by and large it's clear cut in Christianity what the response should be. Uh, not everyone does respond this way, Mohammed, but that Jesus said, you know, those who live by the sword die by the sword. It, it was pretty clear cut that that violence was never an option for Christians when it came to responding to, you know, oppression or blasphemy or whatever. Uh, perhaps not as clear cut in Islam because, as James says, it, it grew in this environment of being pretty quickly a dominant power mm-hmm. and the stories, etc., that come from that. Um, so is this... I mean, this is a problem for Islam, isn't it? Sure. So, so t- tell us what, why... <laughs> They're wrong to do to do what they do. Why? Why this isn't the way that the Quran genuinely admonishes us to to react. Okay. Well, um, Islam, unlike um, say the Catholic Church, it doesn't have a magisterium. So there is no sort of ecclesial structure that gives an authoritative interpretation. Rather, there are. Uh, it's kind of a, a sacerdotum omnium with everybody being priest. It's a priest of all, all believers. And uh, as James rightly said, there are a load of competing interpretations around both uh, the primary text, which is the Quran, and also the oral tradition. There are also very strong questions and debates around the authenticity of various hadith, um, you know, which are debated by Muslim scholars, not not just by Orientalists, by Muslim scholars as to, you know, the political context, you know, these uh, in which these uh, traditions were, were put down, having been written, carried orally for, for a considerable period before they were actually put down. Having said all of that, I think I think we need to sort of you know, be truthful and 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 honest in our in our exploration of these issues. And the fact is that that within um, not just uh, the activities of Christian government, as it were, in Christendom, but also the church fathers uh, didn't uh, ex- espouse non-violence in matters of belief. So, for example, uh, Augustine, and then followed up by Aquinas, uh, believed fervently that uh, it's important not just to punish heretics in the hereafter, but to also deal with them, uh, remove them from uh, from earthly existence and and you know the the burnings of heretics, the, uh, 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 the the destruction of people who disagree or or present views that are critical of Christianity is something that is is part of Christian history, and you have to own that just as much as we have sure. to own our bloody heritage as well. Uh, in relation to the example of uh, uh, of 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 the prophet, you know what what we have in the primary text in the Quran is is no mention of a, of a penalty uh, for for criticism. Or, or, or slander. Uh, rather, it talks extensively about uh, those who have, for example, in in Surah thirty three fifty seven, those who those who have um, have committed uh, wrongdoing. Uh, they will, you know, God will give them their just deserts. You know, in this world, and the and the Quranic interpreters talk about uh, uh, talking about that sort of degradation and, and so forth. But primarily in the hereafter. And and uh, I, unlike some people, I don't subscribe to this idea that sort of there was kind of an early Islam that was abrogated by a later Islam. I think the, these 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 traditions are are, are consistent throughout um, because during the lifetime of the Prophet, uh, the the poets that that, uh, that James refers to uh, were allowed uh, to write extremely offensive uh, and damaging and and slanderous material uh, against the Prophet. Uh, for example, Amr al-Bin As, uh, who uh, uh, wrote 700 abyet, 700, um, what would you call them, sort of, uh, I don't know, stanzas, verses, okay. uh, very, very, very critical of the Prophet. Uh, likewise, Ka'ab bin Ashraf uh, wrote enormous amounts of material that were extremely offensive. Did, uh, did these gentlemen I'm coming pay to for that. their... I'm coming to that. And then, and then Asma bin Marwan, you know, these people wrote mm-hmm. extremely hostile, polemical material against the person of the Prophet, against Islam, against the teachings, calling them a false prophet, all this stuff. They were allowed to live throughout that period. It was when these kind of writings started to act, act as incitement uh, to, to, to violence... Uh, so, for example, Asman bin Marwan uh, incited uh, the uh, the Meccan pagan tribes to, you know, who are, who who of you has honor? Why can't you go out and kill this guy? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the point at which, uh, in that military environment, and as as you know, this is a tribal desert culture in which thar or, or kind of tribal vendetta is the normative way of of dealing with things. Normally, if you insult my my mother, I will go out and annihilate your tribe. Right. In this particular context, relative to the context, an enormous amount of polemic and insult and abuse was allowed. It was when that when that line of 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 threat to security 
uh, started to to emerge. Uh, that's the point at which, in that environment where the Muslim community, the Muslim Muslims in Medina were under existential threat from a pagan Meccan army, uh, when Ka'ab bin Ashraf started to plot with Abu Sufyan, who was the head of the Meccan tribe, to actually annihilate. Uh, those communities. Uh, that's the point at which the same kind of uh, principles that apply in, for example, the laws in this country, uh, where incitement to murder or incitement to security uh, dangers uh, result in retaliation. In that particular context, it resulted in a, in a capital penalty. There's a question as to whether that sets a precedent in Islamic law or mm. not. Mm. Uh, mm. For that's example, the the par- the par- <laughs> it's a big debate. Yeah. It's yeah. a big debate. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but certainly, sort of, you know, things like the Pakistan blasphemy law. A lot of that's just coming, being plucked out of the air. Um, and and there is there's a big debate that Muslims. I mean, Mohammed urges us to own our own bloody mm-hmm. history, James. Um, I mean, yes, we don't have clean hands altogether when it comes to the the history of the church and the way it has dealt with those who uh, dissent. Mm-hmm. But I mean. Were they simply mistaken when you take well, a clear reading of Scripture? Or, I mean, what well, well, it's interesting because uh, the individuals he, he brought up there are individuals that I've lectured about many times as an illustration of the vast difference between the primitive church, which was a time period I was referring to up until the time of the uh, end of persecution, 313. Uh, Augustine begins to develop these ideas uh, almost 100 years later and under pressure from others. And it still takes quite some time for that to develop. And it doesn't develop through a study of Scripture. It develops at the very same time when the study of Scripture is diminishing uh, and tradition is is taking a much uh, greater role in the development of things. And so I would argue that that kind of um, perspective it does not come from a, a, an exegetical reading of the New Testament. It comes from the tradition that developed over that time, that time period and is a perversion of the Christian faith. Um, and so that's, those really aren't, and that's the very end of the period of the early church fathers. But in, those, in that formative period of the first 300 years, there was a fundamental difference between the power of the Islamic State which had control over the collection of the Hadith and, and so on and so forth, and what we have in Christianity, where, where Christianity had no political power at that point in time whatsoever. And I think that has marked itself on how we respond. Because you were asking, why is it that Christians... A lot of Muslims have said to me, you must not really love Jesus all that much if you don't get as upset. Well, this is the question. Yeah. I mean, should Christians do more? I mean, we're not talking about going to anything like these, these lengths, but, but do you sometimes think Christians should be more vocal when the the media it's, it's the what kind of, vo- of vocal see i i get into trouble in the united states because i address subjects that are just politically incorrect and i say things that are politically incorrect but i have to do so you know jesus gave positive teaching about the nature of marriage in matthew chapter 19 he exegeted the creation narrative and said from the beginning this is how god made male and female and when people run around saying jesus never said anything about that kind of stuff I go, what are you talking about he he most clearly did from my perspective the way you respond to blasphemy of jesus is not by punching someone in the nose not by saying you shouldn't have the right to say that but by demonstrating that what the person is saying is untruthful and then using that as an opportunity to say you didn't know who jesus was I've now corrected your misapprehension. Let me tell you some more about him. I mean, one example that springs to mind a few years ago now, but we had a thing called Jerry Springer the Opera put on here in London. I don't know if you ever caught that in. in Well, we have the Jerry Springer show, so that's even worse. It's every day. It was a kind of um, spoof on the the Jerry Springer show, but it involved scenes. You can't spoof the Jerry Springer show. (laughs) It's not possible. It was was a scenario where there was um, a character came on as Jesus dressed kind of in a nappy and. it was a, a kind of somewhat degrading mm-hmm. portrayal of Jesus. Now, a lot of Christians got very upset about that, mm-hmm. and some of them protested outside the theatre, waved the placards, burnt their licence fee, I think, because the BBC were going to screen it on BBC Two and this sort of mm-hmm. thing. I mean, is that valid? Is that the way to respond, or, or, or should it be this very kind of, no, let's get together with people, have a good chat, and sort of debate the issues? Well, for me, the gospel is always the issue. And I want to be able to present the gospel. I want to be able, if I can stand outside and actually make a presentation of the gospel and not get in the way of the gospel, Mm -hmm. great. If it's just about me expressing my anger, that's a different thing. 
my anger is not the issue. For the Christian, we are servants of Christ. He was beaten. He was humiliated. He was hung upon a cross. And he said, do not be surprised. The world hates you. So I don't have any right. The, the, the problem with a lot of that is when you're protesting with a sign, it's you. It's your anger. It feeds the selfish aspect mm. rather mm. than the serving aspect from uh, my perspective. The thing is, the problem is many people's image if they hear the word Christian protest is Westboro Baptist Church oh, and, and their God hates fags sort of stuff. Yes. And, and yes. I mean, but you, you think there is a place for a, a, a positive kind of protest. Positive, positive yes. Mohammed. Absolutely. I think, I think we need to see the, the context for a, for a lot of the, uh, the response uh, to, uh, to things like, you know, books and material coming out of the West uh, in, in, the, in the majority world. And I, I, I'm not just talking about the Muslim world, I'm talking about the Christian majority world as well. Uh, there is a tremendous sense in which people feel put upon and oppressed by the activities of, 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 of the power of, of, of the Western military economic machine uh, that has no respect for things that are sacred and has no understanding of, of a complex uh, scenario in which words can cause ultimate destruction and violence. You know, the, the Holocaust was not the product of, uh, of just a few years of madness in Germany. It was product of, of 2,000 years of, of, of libel, blood libel, um, you know, defamatory things that were said against, uh, against Jewish people over an extended period of time. And it is for, uh, therefore, an absolute incumbent upon both Christians and Muslims and people of other faiths to stand up for the sacred and to speak up vocally, not to desecrate God's name and blaspheme against God's name by violating the, uh, the sanctity of human life and, and committing acts of violence, but to be far more robust in standing up against this kind of well anything goes sort of culture in the West, uh, which has allowed uh, this this kind of uh, environment to develop. And I do point the finger, as I always have, and I'm hated for it, I do point the finger at the Christian church in the West. Um, I, I think the Church of England, uh, and they hate me for saying this on the primary Christian, I'll say it again, Church of England has in many respects become a church of Pontius Pilate rather than a church of Christ. It's a church that betrays the Christian gospel, that's more than happy to, to sell this verse or this bit of scripture in order to accommodate that bit of secular or social compromise. And and I, I you know I, I remember there was this uh, this uh, Anglo Catholic priest in Hackney who was kind of trying to get me to be a kind of an Anglican Muslim or, or a mosque of England. He was kind of saying, <laughs> "Oh, Mohammed, you know you went you went to an establishment public school and establishment Oxbridge colleges. You could you could really help your community." And I I just felt a deep sense of outrage. You know, we as as people you know in the majority world, African Christians, Eastern Christians, you know, we st we fought and we st uh, stood up. Uh, to, to, to challenge, you know, Martin Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ. Not a word was said in, in many Western Christian circles. You know, when uh, Palestinian Christians spoke up when the Blessed Virgin Mary was, 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 uh, was portrayed as a, as a cow, you know, uh, when there's material that's been kind of circular now, they're planning a Hollywood film uh, which portrays uh, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, as the bastard son of a, of, of a, of a rape. And, uh, and I think there is a, there is a, a clear sort of moral duty uh, for, for Christians to understand that sort of, you know, not it, it, it's just to understand free speech, not in these simplistic terms, but to understand how speech can ultimately lead into enormous yeah. damage and, and violence. And you need to speak up more for, 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 um, firmly about it. But that. the interesting thing is that was the story that Celsus told in the third century as well as, uh, about Jesus. I mean, that, that is the attack that has been made for a long, long time. And how did the Christians respond to that? Well, they didn't just lay down. They didn't just ignore it. But they also didn't have the right to do any type of public protest. I mean, they were they themselves were under persecution. So what did they do? That's where the apologists came from. That was the, the period of the apologists. They were seeking to give a reasoned answer. But the, the difference is the, the mechanism of response and the motivation of response is for the betterment of the person you're responding mm. to mm. rather than the destruction of the person sure. you're responding yeah, to. Sure, sure. And my concern is, for example, he, he, he quoted from Surah 33, indeed, those who abuse Allah and his messenger, Allah has cursed them in this world and the hereafter and prepared for them a humiliating punishment. The problem is, once you have a government in control of an area and the leaders of that government uh, have have really autocratic powers, a text like that becomes a pretext for the fact that I have many brothers and sisters who languish 
under persecution to this day in Islamic lands because of texts like that. Because they understand my personal beliefs to be an affront to Allah and his messenger. I mean, the Quran says the worst thing you can say about Allah is that he has a son. Now, whether the Quran understands what we Christians meant by that is one of the big issues. But the Muslim interpretation in those lands is your belief in Jesus as the Son of God is an affront to Allah, mm. and therefore you have been cursed in this world. And if someone's been cursed in this world, why should we really worry too much about how we care for them? Well, um, you know, the, the historic example is of uh, of the Christian delegation that visited the prophets uh, from Najran, mm -hmm. I, with whom he engaged in a robust disagreement around the doctrine of the Trinity and allowed that Christian delegation to pray, to pray in the mosque, mm. the first mosque of Islam. Now, can you imagine the Saudi government allowing that to happen today? <laughs> what we does have that a say? Situa <laughs> we have, exactly. We have a situation where our, where our sacred texts have been interpreted in a very dis in a, in a, in a, in a, in a in a variety of ways, uh, some of them quite extraordinary, actually, uh, to, to, to common sense. But at the same time, uh, I, I think it's really important that we view this uh, issue in a much more complex fashion than has been viewed in sort of strict sort of mm. secular terms mm. of, 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 of free, speech, free speech and right and wrong. And there is an incumbent duty upon Christians uh, to, to recognize that, that, you know, the Christian gospel has been protected at times when Christians have been very vocal and, and spoken up. There are still, you know, and, and also just, 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 for, just as a point of information, there, are, there is still a blasphemy law in this country. It's mm. in Northern mm. Ireland. It's been abolished in 2008 in this country. There is still a blasphemy law in this country, and right until the 1600s, people faced the death penalty uh, for, for, for blasphemy. I'm not saying that we should bring it back. I'm not saying that blasphemy laws are, 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 are at all helpful. There is no blasphemy law in any of the traditional uh, law books of Islam. There are laws around m murder. Uh, there are laws around adultery. There are laws around social crimes. There are no laws in our traditional law, law books relating to theological crimes, uh, such as such as uh, disbelief or, or, or what goes on in a man's heart, because it would be idolatry to put ourselves in the, in the, in the position of God and pass judgment on theological issues. We are going to be taking another short break and, and then starting to wrap things up. Very interesting discussion thus far, though. Um, if you'd like to get in touch and perhaps leave your opinion with me, why not email unbelievable at premier.org.uk. Perhaps you've uh, had opportunity to see this film online. Uh, millions of people have viewed it, The Innocence of Muslims. And uh, what do you make of it? Uh, I'm not asking for your um, thoughts on the production qualities that's pretty clear but um the the actual content and uh, the way it's been responded to around the world i'd be interested in, in your thoughts on uh, the so sorts of issues it's raised for us this afternoon here in the studio um do get in touch at unbelievable at premier.org.uk is the way to do that you can also get in touch via the social media ways uh, at unbelievable jb for the twitter account facebook.com slash unbelievable jb um, and uh, we're going to uh, have a, a little more time with James and Mohammed in just a moment's time here on the show that aims to get you thinking unbelievable this Saturday afternoon and around the world on premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. Welcome back to Unbelievable, final part of the show this Saturday afternoon. If you come back same time next week, uh, then you'll be hearing the discussion that we sort of delayed by a week uh, today uh, on complementarian versus egalitarian views of men and women in the Bible. Uh, for that, I'm going to be joined by Rachel Held Evans, who's a well-known U.S. blogger, um, a keen uh, blogger on the issue of egalitarianism. This is the view that men and women essentially equal um, in terms of their roles um, in Scripture. Um, uh, on the other side of the debate, Owen Strachan, who is uh, based out in the state as well at Boyce University, I think it is. Um, he uh, is going to be uh, taking the complementarian point of view. And in the studio, I'm going to be joined by Adrian Warnock, who uh, will be uh, giving us his views uh, as a UK blogger and um, has... Uh, I don't know, been watching some of the scuffles going on online between people who take different positions on this. So um, if you're interested in that, those kinds of issues, come back next week, 2.30pm here on Premier Christian Radio and online at premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. And we've got some of your feedback and um, uh, some more news on the Atheist Prayer Experiment coming up uh, uh, towards the end of today's programme. <laughs> You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. 
Just finishing up this discussion today, a topical issue, The Innocence of Muslims, is the online film purporting to show Islam is false, Muhammad was a paedophile and various other things. Well, it's caused uh, prior protests, riots around the world, resulted in a number of deaths. Uh, many people obviously lining up to condemn both the film and the reaction to it. That's certainly been the case of both my guests here in the studio, James White and Muhammad al-Husseini. Um, but in a sense, it does raise that whole question of whether... Um, you know, there is a danger because of this of people not being able to say anything um, slightly controversial on the issue of Islam. I mean, it was interesting to see in a very different context a recent documentary that aired here in the mm. UK called Islam, the Untold Story, mm -hmm. um, presented, narrated by historian Tom Holland, um, based on a, a larger book he's written on the subject. And that posed some of those questions about the origins of Islam. Um, uh, you know, what, was Muhammad the character that portrayed in the Quran and the Hadiths and, mm -hmm. and where did this all start and, and uh, well I was watching the programme and I was also on my iPhone watching some of the responses coming in on the Twitter and immediately a lot of it, Muslims started to comment on the programme and um, all very um, you know, obviously dismissive of it and, and saying now a lot of it was sort of you know this guy needs to brush up on his history you know it wasn't anything sort of but here and there some the tenor was uh, rather malevolent um it was and i understand that he has had some death threats made oh, uh, how seriously you take those sort of things i don't know um channel four um decided to um not do a screening of the uh, at their headquarters a screening of the documentary that had been scheduled because of fears surrounding the security issues mm. of that now now, what did you make of that documentary? This, this, presumably you're not going to object to that kind of a historical, not at all, fairly no. impartial, at least in, in the eyes of most people. Um, not at all. No, I, I, I mean, Tom Holland's uh, documentary sort of rehearsed quite a lot of material that's, that's already been out there for, yeah. for a number of, of decades, you know, from, from uh, Cronin Cook and that sort of stuff. And it asks uh, quite legitimate questions about how uh, Islam kind of having grown up in a very marginal geographic area, sort of not in the heart of the literary culture of, of, of the late Roman Empire, uh, there, there's just a lack of, of written source material. That's, you know, absolutely legitimate question to ask. And Muslims should welcome uh, critique. You know, I, 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 you know, I would be racing Hamza when he, if he did come here. <laughs> I'd be racing him to the baptismal font if, if, if people could convince me that the doctrine of the Trinity or, or that another belief uh, is, is true and that it's Islamic belief is, is not true. We should, we should welcome challenge to our faith. We should welcome critique of the sources of, of, of the textual and other sources of our religion as, as, uh, as, as James and, and other colleagues uh, do uh, in, their, in their apologetic ministries. That's, that's material that we should welcome and the kind of Muslims that respond to that in a hostile way are exactly the kind of Muslims who, for whom you know, um, standing up for the Prophet Muhammad is, is exceptionally important. But they don't, you know, if you notice that they don't speak up for Jesus Christ, and we say, it says in the, in the Quran, we don't distinguish between one or other of the prophets. We're supposed to stand up equally uh, for, for, for the Israelite prophets, for Moses and for, and for Jesus Christ. And yet, and yet that that hypocrisy, that double standard, is is uh, is is extant in the Muslim world, and that tells me that tells me everything I need to know about the motivation behind these uh, these responses. Uh, these are tribal honor shame laden uh, responses that have nothing to do with mm. actual honoring the it, faith. And for you, James, are you worried that perhaps more valid critiques um, of the sort of Tom Holland stuff um, is in danger of also losing its voice because of? the way these kinds of protests react to this material i i think 10 years from now that kind of thing will not be able to be aired i really do if if, if the if things keep going the way that they're going um there are voices from the secular side of things that just simply do not feel they're, they're going to say security and peace is more important than the liberty of ideas and that becomes the the, the very formula for totalitarianism and the irony is I don't agree with the thesis of, uh, of that or Robert Spencer's book or things like that. But you know what the irony is? This, is? this is what has caught me in this entire thing. I'm glad we can still talk about it right now. But the irony is, as I have listened to Islamic responses, I have been troubled by the responses. I don't think it's a meaningful response to say that Muhammad existed because the Quran says he did. 
Okay, if that's the best you can come up with, that's not showing that that kind of Islam is actually interacting with the substance of this criticism. And many times the, the Orientalist, quote-unquote, are just simply dismissed because, well, that's who they are, rather than engaging these subjects. I think a much more vital and vibrant defense can be made of the actual existence of Muhammad as a person than almost any of the Muslims I've heard responding have actually offered. Right. But it would require utilizing and engaging the Western historiography, and many of them find that to, in essence, be an act of compromise. And that's one of the problems here, mm. is that... Mm. That's that that continues the divide and and doesn't and, and allow the, the, the conversation. Point is that the, the fact that it's U.S. embassies and things that have been targeted, there's a general kind of feeling that it's Westernism that right. is the problem here, not just this film. It's this film, perhaps for for many people, is the um, the spark, you know, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, and and they feel that this is simply what Western society really thinks about Islam, and and that's, mm-hmm. I mean, and so. It, it, there's a bigger problem here than just whether we let people make silly videos online. It's it's, it's about changing a whole cultural worldview about what the Western world represents, isn't it? Hamid? It's a, it's about power, uh, Justin. I think I think one of the things that uh, that we take uh, we take for granted is this idea that that somehow people have have equality in their in their ability to express their opinions. That's patently not true. Um, one example is, for example, uh, a situation that, that arose in a, in a medical context where uh, doctors uh, of whatever religion were using doctor-patient consultations in order to push particular religious or political ideas on patients. Here we had a very asymmetric power relationship. And that's why, for example, Christians in Uganda uh, feel deeply offended for, for it by, for example, uh, particular Western sexual mores being pushed on them. They feel that their African culture, which is weaker politically uh, than Western culture, is being, is being threatened. So, so that's, that's kind of the context that you rightly address. Uh, at the same time, just, just responding to a couple of things that James said, um, in that sort of... We, we don't have time, you know, Tom, Tom Holland deserves a programme of his own, but in, just, just very briefly, I, I think one of the critiques that have been made of that kind of Orientalist or Western, whatever you want to call it, scholarship, is that, is that it, it's, it, it, it's very narrow and, and is actually in a process of reform and evolution. So, so uh, Western uh, s- demands for, for written sources... Uh, that can be referenced and, and, and attributed, uh, do not take into consideration the cultural realities of, an or, of orality in different cultures. So, mm. for example, in the Arabian desert, it was primarily an oral culture, not a, not a literary culture. Likewise, if you're going to do studies, uh, as I think it was raised in the programme itself, you're going to do studies of, of South American tribes, you know, their oral culture is extremely important to their history. And, and you're not going to find sort of, uh, sort of an index Islamicus uh, of, of, of published texts in, 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 in a desert environment any more than you're going to find uh, sort yeah. of... So, 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 you know, Western scholarship itself is, is, is realising the limitations of some of that narrative and is evolving and adjusting to it. We, we are going to have to start to draw things to a close. Thank you, gentlemen, both, for being with me. Thank you, James, for taking a break in your debating schedule to, uh, to pop into the studio and you record know, with us. It's always a pleasure to be with my favourite uh, <laughs> uh, fellow over in Britain who sits behind a microphone. Well, thank you. I assume you don't have that many other people who sit behind <laughs> microphones <laughs> in the UK. But it's great to have you with me. Thanks, thanks for making the time. Thanks for coming in as well, Mohammed. And, um, and we'll obviously p- post links both to where you can find out more about m- what Muhammad does um, with uh, scriptural reasoning and, of course, James's um, uh, m- ministry, Alpha and Omega Ministries. Uh, so go to the, the website, uh, premier.org.uk slash unbelievable to find out more about both my guests. And um, I'll be happy to, to uh, pass you on to them. Uh, don't forget, you can also tell us what you thought about today's program and um, any of the issues it raised. Uh, we're going to be hearing some of your feedback in just a moment's time. So uh, listen to that as well and uh, and see what you make of that um, apologies that we weren't able to be joined in the end by Hamza uh, Tortoise uh, but perhaps he'll join us on another occasion for another episode of the programme in the meantime thanks again gentlemen for being with me and you're going to be hearing some of the feedback to recent week's programming in just a moment's time Unbelievable with Justin Brierley
Well, we'll be uh, looking at some of what's been going on on the atheist prayer experiment front in a moment's time. Uh, it's been going on for just under a week now and uh, already some really interesting uh, sort of things being posted on the Facebook group, uh, people sending in interesting reports. Uh, I've done a little sort of summary of of some highlights, which you're going to hear later on uh, in this part of the programme. Also interesting this week, wasn't it, to see this story of uh, was Jesus married? Did he have a wife uh, popping up in our papers and that sort of thing, all based on uh, supposedly some kind of fragment of a manuscript from the fourth century where Jesus appears to uh, refer to having a wife. Um, As often with these things, unfortunately, very much um, the media uh, getting hold of something and running with it Uh, if you actually read the paper by the scholar in question um, not nearly so definite about what this fragment could mean Um, and indeed uh, I would recommend going to places like the Tyndale House website in Cambridge Uh, David Instone Brewer a regular guest on this program from that place Uh, and uh, they've done an interesting breakdown of uh, is it fake Uh, if not presumably we can basically say it is uh, another fragment of a Gnostic document, these things that circulated uh, a few centuries after the uh, earliest records of the Christian, of of Jesus Christ were written down. Um, But anyway, uh, interesting stuff. And uh, you've been getting in touch with me as well about uh, recent programs, particularly we've been looking at the issues surrounding pornography in the last two weeks, sort of an ethical issue that we've been tackling. And last week I was joined by a former porn actress, Danielle Williams, and a current adult entertainer, Sophie Hirschfeld, as well as my studio guest, Steve Miller and Peter Watts, um, all with very interesting different perspectives on this from Christian and non-Christian points of view. So um, here's uh, Taylor who says, great topic again, good selection of guests. I have to say, though, that Peter Watts and Danielle, the Christians, really only seem to have anecdotal evidence on their side. I would have been more interested to hear about some actual studies rather than personal testimony, because as Steve and Sophie pointed out, the fact that pornography is a struggle for certain people doesn't mean it has that effect on everyone. I know many couples that watch porn together and aren't keeping secrets. It sounds as if the objection to a single individual enjoying it boiled down to religious beliefs for Peter and Danielle. Of course, there's still plenty of debate among Christians over what the Bible teaches around these issues. Uh, And uh, you say you found the anti-pornography side actually very unconvincing in those debates. Um, On the other hand, uh, here's Mike, who says, Excellent show, Justins. The Christians that Christians should be against pornography seems obvious. But if we're concerned about the well-being of all people in society, then we're forced to interact with situations that are not Christian. The issue is, should Christians be supporting the regulation of degrees of sin? Or should we just condemn sin as sin and reject any notion of controlling it? From a secular perspective, some kind of regulation makes sense. As Christians living in a society with secular and non-Christians, we do support many societal regulations which may not ultimately conform to biblical standards. The question then becomes, if we permit regulation, does that in some way legitimise pornography? I guess uh, referring there to this idea that um, Steve, our atheist guest last week, had of almost making a, a fair trade version of pornography so that people who access it know that people aren't being uh, abused, etc. Whether that's possible or not is another question. But um, uh, you also wanted to say you found a shocking statement actually came from Christian Peter Watts at the church, uh, at the end. He said the church should not condemn those who are using or producing porn. What Bible is he reading, you say? Well, I did get back to you, Mike, to say I think probably took uh, took Peter's statement there out of context. Indeed, he'd spent the last two weeks telling us why he disagrees with uh, using pornography, producing pornography. I think what he meant in that context was in the sense of Jesus saying, I came not to condemn the world, but to save it, and that helping people escape if they want to escape is is, is not about condemning them or disapproving of them, but, but uh, reaching out in love. Um, Kevin in Washington says... The topic of pornography was a great one. I think it needs two or three more segments. Controversial material is the norm on Unbelievable, but these last two episodes were the ones I most strongly wanted to shout into the radio. I have a hard time believing that your guests who promoted a well-regulated pornography industry really believe what they're saying. The longer I'm on this earth, the more I'm convinced that people know what is sexually moral and immoral. I really believe that those who want to call pornography healthy or normal only do so because their conscience consciousness has been calloused we get these calluses when we repeatedly suppress our inherent ethical and moral sensibilities i wanted to ask your guests one simple question 
would they be okay or even encourage their 12 year old daughter to grow up and get into the sex industry after all it's good money right why not and i'm sure if they were honest with themselves they wouldn't want their daughters to have any part in it thank you kevin sorry i haven't time to read out the whole of your email tim uh, says on this uh, this is something i struggled with as a born again spirit filled christian the bible says about what you see through your eyes Um, The truth about pornography in the sex industry is that it is satanic and evil. You might not smoke it, you might not drink it, pop it or inject it, but it is just as nasty and addictive as anything else that Satan tempts you with, says Tim. Thank you very much for uh, your interactions on the issue of pornography. And uh, if you want to listen back to that show, perhaps you didn't catch it, uh, it's all available, of course, at the website premier.org.uk slash unbelievable. That was uh, the last two weeks of programming. Um, let's quickly go to uh, uh, one or two on another topic. Um, let's have some general emails. I've got sort of various piles of emails in front of me under different headings. Um, this one um, says, I've been a listener to the show for probably three years now. There have been some great shows. Every show with David Robertson, for example. He always talks in a great down-to-earth way. He's not scared to say things directly, but the love of Jesus saturates his words. I know you've got tons of stuff to read and do, but if you're looking for new ideas, here's one. Christian Apologetics Cartoons. And uh, this is a website you run, Joshua. Uh, it says noapologiesallowed.wordpress.com. Uh, and you can find there a selection of the cartoons that Joshua produces. I use satire and sarcasm like Elijah and others in the Bible. There is a fine line between that and mocking, and I try my best not to cross it. Basically, I use cartoons as tools to expose folly. And uh, at least one successful example can be seen here. It's one that you've titled Angry Anonymous Atheist's Custom Keyboard. <laughs> um, so uh, there you go. Uh, if you want to view more of those uh, from Joshua, uh, noapologiesallowed.wordpress.com. Uh, Rob Davis wants to suggest a topic uh, for discussion. You say, how about the controversial subject of church discipline? Here in the States, there have been quite a few mainstream articles investigating the practices of many churches who see it as biblical to excommunicate, shun and completely disassociate with sinful members, even to the point of publicly listing a leader or member's sins in detail to the entire congregation could be a great topic for debate and discussion. Thank you very much. I get many uh, suggestions for possible show topics and in a way um, it's always interesting and we'll be doing it next week to do uh, shows that deal with inter-Christian issues as, as that one would be uh, but at the same time I'm aware that a lot of people appreciate Unbelievable precisely because it brings Christians and non-Christians together so I don't want to sort of ever you know sway the balance too far in the direction of, of just having theological debates but thank you very much for that suggestion and, and who knows perhaps we'll get time for it down the line. Um, Okay, let's turn to the Atheist Prayer Experiment. This began uh, on Monday, the 17th of September, running for 40 days. Uh, I've been talking about it quite a lot in recent shows. Essentially, I've invited atheists and agnostics to pray for 40 days to see if God will reveal himself to them. It's based on a philosophical paper by the Oxford professor. Well, not sure he's a professor, actually. Oxford philosopher Tim Mawson. Uh, He'll be joining me uh, in November as we look back on the experiment and some of the uh, reflections and results from it. Uh, But if you want to follow yourself on the Facebook group, that's facebook.com slash groups slash atheist prayer experiment well what i'm doing each week is actually doing a little video blog uh, just highlighting some of the things that have been going on in the week so rather than reproduce that now i'm just going to literally play out the audio from that which you can also find as a video online on youtube so uh, here's me uh, telling you about what's been going on in the atheist prayer experiment this past week Welcome along, I'm Justin Briley and this is the first of a few video updates on the Atheist Prayer Experiment which I'm the person sort of responsible for putting together. I run a weekly radio discussion show on Premier Christian Radio called Unbelievable and I've been inviting atheists and agnostics to pray for 40 days during September and October for God to reveal himself to them. Bit of a crazy experiment, but really interestingly, a lot of people have got on board. So we've got nearly 70 atheists signed up now for this. It's already started. As we record, we're on day four of the experiment. So I wanted to give you a bit of an update about some of the things that have been going on during the course of the last few days. Um, One interesting thing is that two people have dropped out already. 
very different stories about why they dropped out. Uh, let me read you Ben, who was an atheist who wanted to, uh, to take part. Uh, he tried it for one day, but said, uh, I tried my prayer, but you know what? I'm just incredibly staunchly atheist. God does not exist. Uh, and he goes on to say, if God does exist, it's obviously some kind of sadomasochist, not the type of being I would ever wish to worship. And you know what? I'm definitely not being narrow minded. I'm free to think, free to practice my thoughts and free to say my thoughts out loud wherever I so wish. Uh, so I hope you appreciate my honesty. I promise I began this in the best of faith, but simply cannot continue, says Ben. Uh, interestingly, the other person who dropped out dropped out for entirely the opposite reason. Uh, in fact, she dropped out before the experiment began. Uh, that was Kendra, who, uh, who, after having got in touch, got the information about it, emailed me to say, I'm going to have to withdraw from the experiment as I've decided to commit my life to Christ. I took a bit of a double take at that, as I'm sure you may have, but um, she says, I think it was through doing the research on the experiment and listening to podcasts, etc., made me realise that I need Christ in my life. I do believe in God, so I'm no longer an atheist. Thank you for letting me join and for opening up my eyes. Well, interesting start to the experiment. Uh, as it's been going on, though, it's been interesting to see the variety of people who are taking part. Uh, atheists, agnostics, some of them obviously very firm, some of them a bit more open. Um, many of them actually former Christians. Uh, so I could read you Vincent, who got in touch from California, saying he'd sign up. But he spent 25 years as a devoted Christian till one summer he started asking deep, hard questions and decided that really Christianity didn't make sense. Um, sort of... This similar sort of story from Brian, who says he was a Christian for 42 years, took his faith very seriously, um, was a strong apologist even, uh, sometimes led his Sunday school class, attended church. Then one day I woke up and my faith was just gone, he says. But he says, with all that said, I hope this experiment works because uh, this was not a decision I made. It's just how I feel. Uh, and if I got to decide, I would choose Christianity. So um, that's a, an interesting uh, couple of stories of people who are entering this experiment. Uh, let's go to some of the actual people who are blogging and talking about it now. It's interesting, a lot of people have decided they don't want to actually do any interaction during the course of the experiment. They say, I'd rather sort of just do this by myself so that I can't, as it were, be influenced in different directions. But there's also a lot of people who are putting up a blog uh, interacting on the Facebook group, which you can find at facebook.com slash groups slash atheist prayer experiment. And, um, and there's been a lot of interesting conversation going on there. Um, let me uh, tell you about uh, Spooky Valiket. He's actually videoing every single prayer that he says and sort of commenting on it afterwards. Very strange experience, actually. Quite an intensely personal thing to see someone praying, um, especially when they don't know what they're praying to. Uh, then there's also Charlie, who's doing a similar thing. And the question is, well, how hard can it be to fill a few minutes with prayer? Well, Spooky Valaket, like many, suffers from this issue of, well, once I've asked God to reveal himself, what else do I actually s say? What, what am I supposed to pray? Um, here's Freki, what she says she's doing. She says, I went and sat behind the Japanese garden on campus, found a quiet spot, put my feet in the water and gave myself 10 minutes to reflect on the beauty of what it is that I keep hearing is creation. Um, and uh, so that's the way that she's sort of meditating after she said her prayer. Um, there's also the question of what would people be prepared to count as an answer to their prayer? What would evidence look like? Um, here's one of our female contributors again. Uh, this is a former charismatic Christian. She's going under the name Paddy McGingersnap. She wrote about her first day like this. She said, hello, God, if you do exist, I realise you're probably a little busy right now what with half the world going around setting fire to things, but I wonder if you could possibly take some time out to reveal yourself to me. She says, this is how I felt praying this morning. I found it hard to concentrate, partly because my mind is always a bit like a butterfly on cocaine. But uh, no ma major revelations, though when I went out for coffee, a busker was outside Starbucks playing the tune to what used to be one of my favourite hymns. I'm not persuaded that was God waving at me, but it did lift my spirits. Well, on the subject of coincidences, American atheist Brian Higney is trying out the atheist prayer experiment. He says, I have to share these two odd, unrelated coincidences. After the first day of the prayer experiment, well, I've been job searching for the last few months and I finally found an amazing job that I'm more than qualified for. And then after the second day of taking part, Eric Hovind, who's a well-known Christian personality in the US, personally calls me 
out of the blue, I sent him an email a long time ago and he was just now getting back to it. Gee, I wonder what's going to happen tomorrow, says uh, Brian. Well, the question is, can coincidences count as an answer? A number of people have been online saying no, that's just coincidences and when you do this kind of an experiment you're probably more open to seeing connections and coincidences as god incidences so we should be very wary of that but does that mean that god can't communicate that way all interesting questions and we're going to be looking into those more as we go through the uh, atheist prayer experiment probably all i've got time for on this occasion but i hope you'll come back next time i'll do another update soon as we continue to look at some of the experiences of people who are on the atheist prayer experiment you can find out more by visiting premier.org.uk slash atheist prayer experiment so there you go interesting stuff um, and i hope you'll uh, keep uh, tabs on what's going on and indeed join me for the final show when we do look back on the experiment as a whole um, for the moment time to say goodbye and thank you for being with me do come again next time. Let me tell you what we've got. You're unbelievable. We're going to be looking at egalitarian and complementarian theology next week. Long words, but essentially it boils down to what role do women and men have in the Bible, in ministry, in the home? Uh, complementarians would say complementary roles and that means that uh, women are to submit to the husband ultimately in the home and women aren't to have a, a, a leadership role in churches over men well egalitarians see it very differently and we'll be hearing from a leading egalitarian speaker rachel held evans well known online and as a blogger uh, she's going to be in conversation with owen strachan who holds to a complementarian position and they're going to also be discussing uh, a controversial blog post by Jared Wilson quoting another pastor, Doug Wilson, about issues around um, what, how that works out in the marriage bed. So come back next week for what promises to be a really interesting show. Uh, I hope wherever you stand on that issue, you'll want to listen into. Uh, until then, thanks for listening today and we'll see you next week.